For thousands of years, the territory that became known as the San Joaquin Valley was inhabited by scores of Native American tribes. The land was dry, but a great wealth of wildlife existed as far as the eye could see. Ducks and geese, antelope, deer, elk, and more all shared the land and provided sustenance for a hungry people. Life was dominated by the seasons and remained virtually unchanged until the Spanish developed trade routes along the coast, eventually settling throughout the region in the mid-1700s. Baja and Alta California became provinces of New Spain, later Mexico. The missions were established from far in the south, Mission San Jose del Cabo to Mission San Francisco Solano in the north. Numerous California cities are named for the saints. San Diego, Santa Barbara, Santa Maria. Spanish Army Lieutenant Gabriel Moraga is widely considered the first European to venture into the Central Valley from the coastal mission at San Jose around 1808. Moraga's journey left an indelible mark on the state. During his trek, he christened a small creek, San Joaquin. It was later discovered that that creek fed into a larger river, which then took on the same name after Mexico gained independence from Spain in 1821, the number of Alta California settlers slowly began to increase and the region became a valuable property. In 1846, the United States and Mexico engaged in a war for the Western territories and Mexico relinquished control of California in 1848. One year later, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill, sparking a rush of settlers in search of their fortune. California's complexion quickly changed, clothing, housing, and entertainment for the newly arrived miners and their families all had to be obtained. But mostly was the pressing need for food. Rancheros scrambled to meet the exponentially increasing demand for beef by increasing their herds of cattle. But it was the valley itself that held the key. Once a virtual desert, the arid lands of the San Joaquin Valley were tamed by intrepid farmers who learned to move water through a system of canals and brought to life a thirsty soil. And what a soil it was. Grapes became raisins, peaches and figs flourished, nut, cotton, chilies and more grew in abundance. Hundreds of varieties outgrowing the hands available to harvest. From the south once again a movement returned, creating communities, culture, and of course cuisine. In every corner of the valley, spicy salsas, savory tortillas, tamales, and rellenos pan y dulce, bread and sweets, traditional recipes proudly passed through the generations. Everyone has their own special favorites just down the street. The Central Valley's hidden treasures of Mexico. Welcome to Dine Out Sabor. The California Health Collaborative is committed to enhancing the quality of life and health for the people of California. The Collaborative implements an array of programs focused on health promotion, disease prevention, and public health surveillance systems. The California Health Collaborative, building partnerships, promoting wellness, and changing lives. The Law Offices of Philip M. Flanagan, specializing in providing guidance and direction in the areas of estate planning, elder law, probate, trust management, and life care planning proud supporter of Dine Out Sabor. Visit our website or call for more information. Murata Produce is a proud supporter of local businesses, a family-owned grower, packer, and shipper of cherries, walnuts, onions, and bell peppers. Murata Produce is headquartered in the fertile San Joaquin Valley. Owned by the Fopiana family, their farming traditions date back to the California gold rush. Murata Produce proudly supports Dine Out Sabor. No matter where you travel in California, you'll likely notice Hispanic influence. In fact, 38% of the state population is Hispanic. Hi, I'm Ray Ocanto. And I'm Jennifer Whitney. The Hispanic population is even higher here in the Central Valley. We're outside Arte Americas, the largest Latino cultural arts center in the San Joaquin Valley, and it's in downtown Fresno. Today, we're going to look at the role Mexican culture has had on the valley through food. 
I'm going to visit a restaurant where they've been cooking up authentic Mexican cuisine for nearly 40 years. And also stop by a specialty Mexican ice cream shop. So, Ray, while you're visiting those spots, I'm going to head to a local Mexican bakery and go inside Arte Americas for a tour. That sounds great, Jen, and we'll be right back here in just a little bit. All right. I'm outside Cuca's Restaurant. There are two locations, the original on F Street in downtown Fresno, the other one right here on Olive in the Tower District. I'm going to go inside and talk to third generation owner, Margaret Suefuentes. Her family has been cooking delicious, authentic Mexican cuisine since the early 1970s. Vamanos! I'm with third generation owner of Kuka's, Margaret Sofuentes. Margaret, hi, it's great to see you. Hi. Tell us a little bit about Kuka's. The history and the legacy of the family comes from downtown on, on, on F Street, right? Yeah. Yes, we started uh, Kuka's in Chinatown on F Street in 1974. Yeah. You know what's so interesting about Kuka's when you walk in, it's almost like nothing has changed since you started that restaurant over 40 years ago. And I always notice the wallpaper. There's a history and a story behind that wallpaper. Why has that wallpaper never come down? That wallpaper's never come down because we opened December 26, which is a day after Christmas. On Christmas Eve, my uncle stood up all night putting up the wallpaper. Uh, about a year later, my uncle was killed. So to me, that's the only memories I have. My fondest memories of my uncle is him staying up all night, making sure that the wallpaper was going to look nice the next day. And, you know, sometimes there's, you can see where it's lifting off the walls, but I, I won't change it. I, it's a part of my uncle that I, I keep. I think about the legacy and tradition of your family, too. Three generations of strong Latina women running a restaurant. Gina, your daughter, will be the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember your grandmother and uh, being around the kitchen and cooking with her? What was that like? So my fondest memories are with her cooking or, or going to the store to buy something on how she would teach me the different smells, the different... Uh, Chiles to buy and stuff like that, and, and it was just something that I'll always treasure are those memories of her teaching me how to cook. There's something special about a cook, and I know that being a little bit of an amateur chef myself is that sometimes the greatest creativity comes with just experimenting and playing. And I know you don't really, you, you have a recipe for some of your great recipes like chili verde and your tortillas, but a lot of it is just for your soul and your heart, right? That little extra pinch of this, a little pinch of that. I put a little pinch, but I basically stick to what my grandmother taught me, how mm -hmm. to do it the pinches that she taught me. <laughs> there is no teaspoons or a tablespoon of that or a cup of this, it's all pinches. Yeah, just uh -huh. a little sprinkle uh -huh. here and there. Yeah. And you know, really, there's so many Mexican restaurants in the valley, but really you're known for a couple of things. What, what do people order? What do they, what do they always okay. come in to eat? Well, the one thing that has been the most popular throughout the years is the huevos con chile verde. Mm. And uh, if you like our chile verde, then you can't find it like that anywhere else, or the chile colorado. Once you're hooked on my chile colorado, you don't find it anywhere else. They're completely different, and I don't give the recipes away, especially to the chile colorado. That's my recipe, my secret. Now, what are you most proud of when you, when you open the door every day to serve the people of Fresno? Uh, the most things I'm proud of is when people come in and they give me their fondest memories of their grandparents or even great-grandparents. We're going to start pretty soon, our, like our sixth generation of customers. And it's pretty neat when they sit at a corner and they start telling you the stories or just they tell you, you know, I'm, my blessings are to you because your grandmother did this for me or my grandmother did that. And those are my fondest memories of coming to the restaurant every morning. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. What's going to happen the next generation? Your daughter is, uh, Gina owns this one here in the Tower District. And uh, do you want to keep the legacy going? Who's next in line? We haven't found the next one in line. I mean, I've got a grandson that says that he wants to uh, take over the businesses, but he wants to start from the top. And I keep telling him, you got to start from the bottom. You've got to learn how to cook. i, I got to give you the chile colorado recipe, and then maybe you can go on from there. <laughs> you can give it to me. I'll open up a restaurant. I'll do it with you, too. <laughs> My grandmother will go haunt you if I give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> After all this discussion about this great food and comida, my mind is smelling flavor and chili and chili verde and homemade tortillas. I, I want to try some. I want to sample some of that great Cuca's food that you're known for. A restaurant's signature really starts with their chips and salsa. Jalapenos, onions, tomatoes, spices. This is cocido. I know what this is. It's one of my favorite soups. The beef shank soup with mm. the cabbage, um, oh. corn, 
perfectly spiced. Chili verde. Chili verde. And this is really probably for your family, one of your signature dishes. Yes. You're really proud of this dish. Yes, we are. Mm. Makes its own little savory sauce, that right? Perfect That's bite. So, mm. It comes from your grandmother's right? Your great grandmother's Great grandmother, yes. Yeah. This is Chile Colorado, and as I was telling you, I brought you some boiled beans so you can try our boiled yeah. bean. I'm trying to keep my great grandmother proud by serving great food. So tasty. Um, one of my favorite dishes here at Kukas. We're gonna walk across the street now for something sweet at Panderia Natale. This is Brandon Herrera. He is the manager of Natalie's Bakery, also known as... Panaderia Natalie. You say that so well. Tell me a little bit about your baked goods. What do you make here? We make actually over 50 different um, pastries and breads. The breads are sweet. Um, so, you know, a lot of them have, you know, a lot of sugar, but uh, they're, they're eaten a lot with coffee in the morning. Some of the most popular is the conchas uh, and the bolillos. How does this work? Do you make it fresh every day? Do oh, you, yes. Is that what you're doing when you're getting up? When you first get here, you're yes. starting fresh every day. Everything's made fresh every day. We're actually physically making the bread from about 2 to about 10 or 11. Uh, so the process of making the bread can last anywhere from you know eight hours to twelve or more hours in the winter time when it's really busy. We have to make you know uh, mix the ingredients, turn it into dough, uh, you know rise the dough, bake it. There's a process. What's your favorite? Uh, my favorite's actually the empanadas. We make different flavors. Uh, we have apple, lemon, um, apricot, cream, uh, pineapple, and pumpkin. My favorite is the apple. Mmm, okay. So it's very reminiscent of apple pie. What kinds of things are for certain occasions? In January, we have uh, Three Kings Day. Uh, we make uh, what's called the Rosca de Reyes. For Halloween, we make the Pan de Muerto. And that's for the Day of the Dead. And it's, you know, it's the Day of the Dead bread. So it, it's kind of it's kind of like a big bun, uh, a lot of sugar and it kind of looks like it has a spider on the top. So we've got all kinds of fantastic things. It smells so good in here, as I said. Thank you so much for taking your time, Brandon. Thank you so much. So speaking of sweets, Ray has made his way to a Mexican ice cream shop in Fresno where they make their own popsicles and ice cream, but I'm very happy with this. I've had my eye on this. Butter, sugar, and bread. Does it get any better than that? I'm here with Daisy Alvarez, the 19-year-old daughter of Gabriel Alvarez, the owner of La Reina de Michoacan. How long has your family run this, uh, this ice cream parlor? We've been open since 2004. My dad's the owner. It's a family-run business. What made, you, what, what made you open an ice cream parlor in Fresno, Mexican one, for that matter? Is there something special about that for you and your family? Well, where my dad's from, it's really popular. And ever since he got here, it was his dream to open up a Mexican ice cream shop here in Fresno. Yeah. If you like working, that's got to be a kid's dream. Dream, right, yes. to work at an ice cream parlor. It's Come pretty on. awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I noticed your favorite ice cream is laying here on this table yes. too. Yeah. Everything Describe that a little bit. What do we got in front of us? Well, right here we have a tres marias, which is a three, di you know, three different flavors with the Mexican cookies. Mm -hmm. And then right here we have strawberries and cream, which is strawberry mixed with cream. I'm gonna try this. Can I? Yes. This just looks delicious. Hmm. Mmm. Amazing. It's really good, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, really just a lot of strawberries yes. in it. Is that what makes Mexican ice cream unique? Is just the, the fruit yes. and the flavor? The exotic fruits, mm -hmm. different flavors. Yeah, what do we have here? What's this right one? Right here is actually nanche. Manche. And in English, nanche. Nanche. We call it yellow cherry. Yellow cherry. It's an exotic fruit wow. from Michoacan. I don't know that I've ever tasted anything like that. Yes. It's unique. It's different. Mm -hmm. I don't have to taste anything like that ever. This one's also made from cream, as well as this one. Now, that's unique to Mexico, right? Yes. That is not grown anywhere but in Mexico, uh -huh. I believe, right? My dad brings it. Okay. Now, I've been to your ice cream parlor before, and I've tried this one. I know what this is. This is the chili and mango, mango right? Chili. Yeah. This is so good. Wow. It's it really tastes that chili flavor. Mm -hmm. it's, I can feel on the back of my tongue. Yes. 
That is good. That yeah. is good on a hot day in Fresno. When it's 110 degrees, grab one of those, right? The mango's also really yeah. good in it. This is interesting. Yes. I don't know that anybody knows you can make ice cream out of this. What is this? Avocado, and it's actually <laughs> mixed with passion fruit. Wow, so passion really fruit good. and avocado. It's cream based as well. Oh, that is delicious. It actually mm. sells a lot too, actually. Do you have any chips to go with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> what do your customers say about when they come in here? Because really, this is not Baskin Robin. This is so different. The flavors are different. They love it. They even come from out of town. People come from Oregon. The family came from Oregon last week, and they were like, we came just for you guys. The thing that I am most amazed by and surprised by is when you walk, drive out the street here on Belmont, mm -hmm. that all this is made here from scratch. Is it all made here? Yes. Right here in your own little kitchen back there, yeah, right? Yeah, right here in the back. Every day, my dad, we make them. Yeah. Customers are surprised. Oh, you guys make them here? We're like, yeah. So how many do you make a day? How many paletas are you making every day? About 300. 300. And mm -hmm. how many flavors do you have, uh, different flavors and varieties? Like 30, 35 different flavors. Well, let's go back and see how some of this stuff is actually made from scratch. Can we go do that? Yes, let's go. Great. If anybody knows me, they know I'm an ice cream addict. And I can tell you, I got my new best friend, Gabriel Alvarez, who's the owner of La Reina de Michoacan. Gabriel, como estas? Un placer. Gabriel, tell me the reason why you opened an ice cream shop in Fresno. No, yo emigré aquí en el 83. Y en Michoacán tenemos unas paletas riquísimas, riquísimas. Y entonces me di cuenta que aquí no había ese tipo de paleta. Entonces me ocurrió la idea de poner esas paletas michoacanas con, much, con mucha fama en todo nuestro país. Y así surgió la idea y, y pusimos, pusimos la paletería. One of my favorite flavors is chili and mango, but you have a bunch of different flavors. Oh, esa paleta queda riquísima porque traigo un chile especialmente de ahí de mi pueblo, de Uruapan, mm -hmm. que es riquísimo y es lo que le da un sabor muy especial a esa paleta. The paletería has a really special name, La Reina de Michoacán. Tell us why you named it and, and the history and, the, and the, the, the culture behind ice cream in Michoacán. Bueno, La Reina de Michoacán es un nombre muy popular en México. Es un, una paletería que surgió en Tocumbo, Michoacán, y se hizo muy famosa por todo nuestro México. Y por eso todo el mundo que oye La Reina de Michoacán se dan cuenta que se habla de, de las mejores paletas de nuestro México. Son riquísimas, son riquísimas. Tenemos muchas frutas muy exóticas del trópico, que son riquísimas. Ya, yeah. so. que okay, bueno, ándale pues. Muchas gracias, Gabriel. Gracias, gracias. Sí, sí. So I'm inside now, Arte Americas, which is at the corner of Calaveras and Van Ness in downtown Fresno. And joining me is executive director, Frank Delgado. What an amazing building. This is so pretty. Well, tell me about the history. Well, the building itself has an incredible history. It began as a mansion. Uh, it was the short home, the short mansion. And uh, after that, it was a church. It was a bank. Uh, it was an iMagnons department store uh, for a long time. And then ultimately, it became Arte America. So it has a very long history behind it. It really does. And what was the idea of bringing it here? Originally, uh, with Arte Americas, yes. it was to be able to display Latino artwork on a consistent basis in a gallery setting. Um, when we first started 27 years ago, it was a different world at that time. And it was uh, the approach of, we will create our own place to be able to share our heritage and culture. Now, 27 years later, we have evolved in many ways. We are still featuring primary Latino art but we have expanded, and so the artists that show here are may, may not always be Latino themselves, but they are addressing Latino issues and the Latino experience. How has the community embraced it? The community itself, being a large Latino community, has uh, been very supportive, but it's notable to say that the art community here in Fresno has really embraced us, and so there are a large number of people who come to events that are uh, let's say Latino based, let's say a mariachi concert, but you'll see a great deal of people who are out here that are not Latino themselves, but that are, uh, that have people in their families that are Latino, that uh, are just getting to know the Latino culture and getting a chance to experience the uh, art and music of, of the traditions and the culture itself. So you talk about the mariachis, is that what would 
take place outside in the pavilion? Mm -hmm. During the summer, we have an annual concert series, and every Friday it's a different style of music. So there's Latin jazz, there's smooth jazz, there's a band called Metalachi. They're a mariachi and heavy metal no. amalgamation. Yes, so they're a mariachi that plays Led Zeppelin and Guns N' Roses. <laughs> but we also have salsa music, Brazilian music, all different styles of music. It changes every Friday, and what ends up happening is people who may not have uh, chosen on their own to go and see a Brazilian music concert or a smooth jazz. Uh, they end up coming out here. It's a family environment. And so this really gives us a chance to expand what we're doing. And the galleries are open during that time, so during the intermission. A lot of people who come out here for the very first time to come and hear music get a chance to come and see what we're doing inside as well. So tell me about the exhibits that you've had here. Over the past maybe five or six years, we have really expanded uh, the way that we approach our exhibits. The, there's more of a cohesive approach in the way that the uh, different exhibitions will go with each other. We'll have uh, themes that run throughout the uh, entire community center. Our most popular exhibit annually, we have a Day of the Dead, the Dia de los Muertos exhibit. That event itself happens on November the 2nd and that has grown exponentially. Maybe there were fewer than 500 people uh, four years ago and last year we had 2,500 people total. Good time for people to check it out if they haven't yet. Absolutely. All right, Arte Americas Executive Director Frank Delgado, thank you so much. Thank you for, for talking me. about this wonderful place and good luck the Thanks rest of this here. year. And I'm going to head on out now to the pavilion because I want to go catch up with Ray. Hey, what are you doing here by yourself? Waiting for you. I brought you a treat. Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is from the... La Reina de Michoacan, <gasps> the Mexican ice cream uh, shop here in Fresno. Delicious. Mm. Mate, what's the flavor? That is chili and mango. One of my favorites. Spicy, delicious, right? Oh, that's really good. And I was at the bakery earlier. Yeah. So I've had all kinds of fantastic Mexican pastries today. In addition just to just hanging out at Artes Americas, yes. the Hispanic Cultural Arts Center. Yeah. Love it. And how about the great history and tradition of Cuca's restaurant and Margaret Sufuentes and her family and running that restaurant for 40 years and just creating some amazing recipes here for all of us to enjoy. I have so much dedication. Yeah. It's amazing. It's and great. the return customers, which really tells the whole story. Yeah, and this is the rustic look of that old restaurant downtown Fresno on F Street. Just the way it was even 40 years ago. Absolutely. And you know, Jen, it's clear the Hispanic culture and heritage is strong here in the Central Valley. To learn more about the places we visited today on Dine Out Sabor, visit DineOutTV.com. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time for Dine Out Sabor. The California Health Collaborative is committed to enhancing the quality of life and health for the people of California. The Collaborative implements an array of programs focused on health promotion, disease prevention, and public health surveillance systems. The California Health Collaborative, building partnerships, promoting wellness, and changing lives. The Law Offices of Philip M. Flanagan, specializing in providing guidance and direction in the areas of estate planning, elder law, probate, trust management, and life care planning proud supporter of Dine Out Sabor. Visit our website or call for more information. Murata Produce is a proud supporter of local businesses, a family-owned grower, packer, and shipper of cherries, walnuts, onions, and bell peppers. Murata Produce is headquartered in the fertile San Joaquin Valley. Owned by the Fopiana family, their farming traditions date back to the California gold rush. Murata Produce proudly supports Dine Out Sabor.